Greetings everyone, and welcome to LEGO Rewind, where we take another look at all retired LEGO themes. Except today, where everything we're covering is still ongoing, but at least one of them seemed to go quiet for a time, back when I first started this series. I remember 2001 for a lot of things, but something that almost passed me by that I've since grown to love is Harry Potter, one of the first licensed LEGO lines. I didn't know anything about the books or movies, but I knew I wanted that train. I remember when individuals across America decried Potter as endorsing real witchcraft and forbade their kids from being corrupted like these poor souls. It was probably the only thing they hated more than Pokemon and Star Wars. Even the Force was the work of the devil. <laughs> Doesn't mean I didn't watch those movies in those days. Oh, by the way, this is a Star Wars episode too. Yeah, I was going to dedicate an entire separate episode to Star Wars later this season, but I realized I had a lot of the same things to say about both lines, which shouldn't be surprising. They both came out around the same time, and they were subject to a lot of the same trends and changes as you see LEGO transform throughout their lifespans into what it is today. They have a lot in common, and what with all the parallels, I didn't feel right padding out this season by uploading the same episode twice, just with different slides. So whatever, we're doing it all here. I guess this is the licensed themes episode, since I don't want to focus too much of the show on that territory either. Let's talk about Harry first. The first three years were their own era of sorts, a nice mix of Sorcerer's or Philosopher's Stone and Chamber of Secrets featuring many traits that would soon be dropped. A good number of sets were very small, basically impulse buys for kids who didn't have a lot of money, recreating scenes from the movies rather modestly. They had that dollhouse quality with lots of cloth and brighter colors. My favorite example is the clothing on the troll, gives some extra dimension to it. The first version of Hogwarts Castle was quite large, though kind of empty, which is how LEGO got away with gigantifying a lot of stretched out sets that that would sometimes make them very cheap, but in this case, not so much. Gotta pay for that license somehow. We'd explore the numerous nooks of the castle, and not all of them were winners, far from it, but ones like this stand out as particularly nice. Could have just left it at fluffy, but they included the plants underneath. These medium sized sets are the best shape and depth, I think. While the bluish gray roofs we have now create good contrast, I'm still partial to that extra bit of life the sand green adds to these older sets. Probably the most awkward aspect are the minifig faces. They try to look realistic, sorta, with very detailed mouths and emotions ranging from mildly amused to slightly perturbed. They do have some charm, especially in the days where movie characters still had yellow skin. Although I think it's worth mentioning Snape would sometimes glow in the dark for some reason. Poor guy always looks like he's about to puke. The box art was particularly nice, making it appear like you were inside Hogwarts, peering out at what Harry and friends were doing. Always at dusk, with very warm colors like in the first couple of movies. 2004's Prisoner of Azkaban brought a hefty amount of sets, and you can already see the changes. The builds were a bit more condensed, the characters have realistic skin tones, though the expressions are the same, the backgrounds are much more detailed and diverse, and the castle foreground has been scrubbed clean in favor of that textureless, flavorless blue band that everything had in 2004. I'm glad it didn't stick. Some things like the Hogwarts Express barely changed at all, though the addition of a tender was much appreciated. I took the original apart and rebuilt it so many times. Like the movies, these sets were beginning to find their groove, but all too quickly we saw their presence shrink, with only four Goblet of Fire sets, which were all action pieces. And then only one for Order of the Phoenix, but what a spread it is! Compared to the original, and right around the same price if not less with inflation, it has presence. Though they really gave up on the character shot here. Curiously, we started to see the old faces phased out from more slick, cartoony ones you'd expect from LEGO, though this wasn't always the case. We wouldn't see any more sets for three years, though it did get something of a resurgence with two Deathly Hallows sets and one for Half-Blood Prince. Better late than never, I suppose. They focused more on updating many old moments with all the new pieces and tricks of the day, and we got the most faithful representation of Hogwarts yet, though that's admittedly pretty subjective, seeing how much it changes between films. By this point, it seemed like they had the style nailed down. The sky was the limit and uh, then it went quiet for the better part of a decade. It just stopped. No more Harry Potter. I can kind of understand that without any more movies coming out, they didn't think new sets would be relevant, but it's still a shame. For a while there, it looked like we'd never see new Harry Potter sets again. But before going any further, let's dial back to 1999, when the first Star Wars sets came out. Okay, look, this line has been going for 20 consecutive years, and if I talk about every single set one at a time, we'll be here all day. So let's go. On paper, 1999 was a perfect time for LEGO to tackle Star Wars. For better or worse, the Special Editions and the Phantom Menace made Star Wars relevant to a new generation, and for all its faults, Episode 1 did make a hell of a toy commercial. There were more speeders and tanks and starfighters than LEGO knew what to do with, and 
and an aesthetic that LEGO was not equipped to recreate. All those smooth, immaculate curves that gave Episode 1 its identity, yeah, those first couple years were rough, literally. Most of the builds were okay, but I think the worst example may be Darth Maul's Bloodfin Speeder. It makes me wonder how Harry Potter would have turned out a few years earlier. These early attempts were valiant, but LEGO simply wouldn't be able to capture those sorts of shapes until 2002. The pieces just didn't exist yet. They had a few leftover elements from UFO, insectoids, and the like, but I think the original trilogy made a much smoother transition to LEGO, already being pretty blocky. They still made a lot of new pieces for those early waves. The cannons, the engines, the windscreens, the wings, those were all made for these sets. Those pieces, while specialized, were just versatile enough to be shared across the line. It gave LEGO Star Wars a distinct look, and I can only imagine what a dream come true it was for kids and adults. I mean, look at this. This is one of the earliest documented mocks in existence, 1982. And it's good, people couldn't wait for Star Wars, and LEGO saw that. It was nice being able to afford an ATST for $10 in those days, inaccurate as it was. Similarly, all those tower rooftops were made specifically for the Harry Potter line. That is a plus for these licensed themes. You got a lot of cool pieces that LEGO wouldn't have an excuse to make otherwise. I really like the early box art. The realistic backgrounds clashed a little bit, but I like the sun-drenched look some of the sets have. And everything else was stellar. The gold text at the bottom, the stars, the group shots for the Phantom Menace and the original trilogy. It was kind of weird how much more colorful Menace was. The minifigs were nice. They didn't try to look overly realistic in the face prints, which again were still yellow. But remembering how LEGO cancelled Seatron because they weren't ready to make molds like that, only to then turn around and make an entire unique new head for Jar Jar, Overbite and all, makes it really funny to me that we were getting characters like Draco Malfoy and Han Solo in those days with such distinctive hairstyles. And the closest LEGO could get to that was this. One size fits all, I guess. At least Harry got a nice hairpiece. Jar Jar kind of opened the floodgates for other similar characters like Yoda and Dobby, which for the longest time went unpainted, though for some there was a plus given how uncanny the first face prints were. Meanwhile, those B1 battle droids have been chugging on for 20 years with barely any changes. Funnily enough, we've kind of gone back to those earlier heads with the newest sorting hat mold. Before that, its face was just a print, and before that, it didn't have a face at all. It was just a normal hat. Something about this Ultimate Collector series box art haunts me. I just like how muted and isolating it is. It's colder than Star Wars usually is. The colors were messy for a while, adding too much gray to some things and too many highlights to things that didn't need them. They just seemed afraid of using too much of any one color uninterrupted, or not being colorful enough to grab kids' attention. The blue was a staple of LEGO's TIE Fighters that would stick around for years, like they were still coming to grips with what they were doing. We even see a bit of sand blue in some of them today. I already covered these Technic figures in episode 4, not that episode 4, so I won't go over them again here. I still like them. 2002 was where things started to smooth out. We got a lot of new dark and sand colors and a ton of new pieces that made episode 2 sets a less bumpy ride, and the new box art was powerful in a way. It just jumps at you. We saw a couple of first wave sets re-released which were showing their age. Already we had a beautiful new Naboo Starfighter that really illustrates how fast LEGO was evolving. Heck, just compare this slave one to the other, just two years older. The builds were getting bigger with a new air of confidence. By the way, this is still my favorite version of a destroyer droid they ever made. By 2003, the out-of-place extra colors and whatnot were phased out. What really stuck out this year were the mini sets. I remember these making a big impression. The power of the force of the palm of your hand. For kids whose families were too poor to afford the bigger, increasingly complex sets, or maybe just didn't have a lot of room or time, these were a godsend. And some of them came with extra bits of an entire new build like some action figure lines do. The smaller sets came in pairs, and there were few things as satisfying as being able to recreate the Battle of Hoth on your desk. Mini was just a great idea, and it's rightfully stuck around. There's that annoying blue band again. I still think this is one of the best Star Wars sets in terms of how much content you get. I especially like the weeds hanging from the X-Wing, and the Falcon, which was kind of embarrassing the first time, really took shape here. 2005 was such a hype year. Even with a building disdain for the prequel trilogy, LEGO had a lot to live up to with Episode 3, and I think they did pretty well for their first attempt at a lot of these. This is also where they abandoned the yellow skin tones, and from here, they just kept going for a few years, adding more realism to their builds and steadily dropping those special elements the line started with, settling into a groove and continuing to improve. There's just not much I can say about this era. It became business as usual, but 2008's The Clone Wars brought some fresh material to the front lines. While the faces 
weren't ideal, we got a lot of cool things that haven't been revisited in the last decade. It's kind of hilarious to me just how oversized some builds got. Scale is a messy subject for LEGO, and you can't always expect them to get it right under the best circumstances, but people got so used to LEGO's interpretation of size that the actual size threw them off a few times. The new version of this tank is much smaller than the old one, but this is its proper size. On the flip side, this vulture droid seems huge because we got so many smaller ones before, but it's supposed to be that big. Look at how tall they are! Something I wish they'd try again was MIDI scale. Not big enough for minifigs, but not quite mini. Still having a good level of detail that won't drain your wallet or eat your desk's entire surface. They did it a couple of times and just kinda gave up. My word, nine years and this thing has barely changed at all. One thing that annoys some fans is LEGO's need to squeeze pilots into things that don't have pilots. This vulture droid is its own ship, but kids might not understand that. They might just think it's a cool ship and want to sit someone down inside it, and having to create room for an entire minifig can compromise an otherwise sleek build in big ways. Oh well, LEGO is a toy company and they have to make fun toys first and foremost. In 2012 we got our first examples of micro fighters, which are big these days. Not sure how many people remember those starting with these. Like the Clone Wars before, the last few years have been taken over by the new movies and Star Wars Rebels. And on the system front, we haven't suffered much, though some of these builds I could do without. And a couple went way off the mark. Likely because Disney didn't give LEGO all the reference material they needed to design these properly. But the Ultra builds in particular were horrendously mishandled. Look, I'm not gonna debate the merits of CCBS as a system or LEGO making action figures in this episode. That's for another time. But let's look at where they actually went with these. General Grievous and characters like him were made to be built like this. Armored up characters like Darth Vader, Jango, and Boba Fett or troopers all work well. And you can kind of get away with more fleshy characters, though it is a stretch. This opening lineup was good, and it would have been great if they continued along that route, bringing many different classic Star Wars characters to life. But to keep up with the Christmas present approach to releasing new Star Wars movies yearly, LEGO had to focus on characters from Rogue One and Solo on top of the main series films, so we didn't get that many characters outside of those movies, and the builds we did have grew repetitive pretty quickly. These constraints prevented the line from really flourishing, and we lost some fine-looking sets towards the end. That collar and Darth Maul was part of a super battle droid head that was cancelled, and these were expensive. Like, even throwing piece counts aside, the prices weren't terrible at first, but by the end, they were charging for the moon. A kid isn't going to spend $35 on a figure that'll lose pieces if they drop it when they could spend 10 or so on a smaller, more realistic figure from the Hasbro section. I still see see these at Target. They just can't get rid of them. We'll get back to Harry Potter in a sec, I swear. As for system, with all the new movies and shows so focused on TIE Fighters and X-Wings and such with minimal to no changes, the sets can, at times, get a little monotonous. And I understand for some old school Star Wars fans, that's what it should focus on. But I am not one of those people. And as soulless as the prequel trilogy may be as a product, there was something exciting about seeing so many creative new designs. Walkers and ships that, to many, don't belong in Star Wars. And even towards the end, things like the Jedi Interceptor, while vaguely recognizable as a TIE Fighter, or prototype was still visually different enough to be interesting. And I miss that. I miss that newness. I wish they weren't playing it so safe lately. And look, if I have to choose between letting them focus on telling a story or making something that looks cool as a toy, it's clear what I should pick. And on that toy front, we are still getting an acceptable mix of things from all of Star Wars movie eras. It is not an overstatement to say the level of detail crafted into these newest iterations is incredible. Nothing like the originals. I just wish there was a little something else, cause what are we gonna get after all these movies are done? Just more of the same? I guess it's not so bad if the 20th anniversary remakes released this year or anything to go by. I think it really says something that some of those older elements, like the cannon, still look good enough to use, but they were able to work those engine chunks out of Anakin's pod racer completely. They can design pretty much anything they want with normal pieces now. These sets also include older minifigs, yellow skin and all, though there are some discrepancies. It really is such a stark contrast. Some things I really want to see while we're at it are a new Django Fed style Slave 1 and a blue MTT. And pretending this is still a Harry Potter episode, I recently rewatched The Sorcerer's Stone with Fam, who'd never seen any other movies, to get myself in the right spirit for this. And we really enjoyed it, so that was nice. And these last couple of years, oh man, 
let's be honest with ourselves. This is the best LEGO Harry Potter's ever been. Since we went so long without any new sets, it's kind of jarring just how extensive of a facelift they've gotten. I already noted what a jump in realism the latest Hogwarts Express had in the Trains episode, and again, I don't want to pad this out by repeating myself. Now that they can go back and lift things from any point in the series they want, they've been releasing chunks of Hogwarts that appeared in certain scenes that work as modules, so you can chain them together in numerous combinations. The textures and shaping are consistent, so they fit together perfectly from year to year. There's still a ways to go, but I'm confident we'll see other parts of the school fleshed out before long. I'd like to see the Chamber of Secrets revisited. The latest version of the Basilisk is garbage. <laughs> Say what you will about the old one, at least it was green. Also, its fangs are literally knives. But hey, looking at the latest versions of Aragog and the Hungarian Horntail, I think it's only a matter of time before the Basilisk gets the same treatment. We also got some fantastic, fantastic beast builds. I know people don't care as much for these, but as an SP, I strongly identify with Newt. I like those animals, and the transforming suitcase is very clever. I've heard it said these feel incomplete, with a missing backside. And while it would be nice for them to close up like some dollhouses, it's not like we only get half a building, more like 60 to 75% of it. For most angles, you'd never know. And personally, I like having easy access to the interior, like it's a cross-section. If you don't want to see inside, just turn the back towards the wall. And if you want to display the inside, well, at least you don't have entire extra sheets of plastic pushed to the end of the shelf. And while I don't think it's always been like this as a good excuse in itself, I do think this type of build is a sensible compromise, and it does keep the price down to a degree. The minifigs are spot on. A very natural midpoint between the awkward attempted realism and that one-size-fits-all LEGO look, pulling it off better than the 2010 revival. But seeing as it was lines like this and Star Wars that necessitated the creation of shorter legs for smaller characters that unfortunately can't walk, it's all too fitting that this latest revival has prompted the creation of medium-sized legs, still shorter than adult minifigs, but able to swing properly. Now you can see Harry grow from 11 to 13 to 17 without looking weird next to older characters. The most impressive build to date is this completed hog worst mini build that is, naturally, enormous. If this scaled with normal minifigs, you might not be able to fit inside your house. But again, I already touched upon this in an earlier episode. Boy, for a guy who doesn't want to focus on licensed sets, I sure do talk about them a lot. I love these, they're just rock solid and I can't wait for more in this vein. I hope it keeps going for at least a few years. While Star Wars just keeps going, there's something about Harry's long away of return that's impacted me more. Though it's entirely possible it may eventually overstay its welcome. I don't know. To be clear, I don't hate licensed themes. I don't even mind if LEGO makes the one set for something like Stranger Things here and there. I think it's apparent just how much passion goes into designing these. All I want is a decent balance between that and LEGO's own properties, like half and half. Doesn't that sound reasonable? I've heard it suggested that if LEGO didn't have to make Aqua's own and Adventures way back when, and could have just made Indiana Jones instead, they would have. And... Yeah, that's pretty sad to me. The idea that we by no means should have gotten any of the cool things we did out of what was for LEGO still a dark time, and licenses have arguably saved them. They don't need original products now. I didn't mind the presence of Harry Potter or Star Wars or Spider-Man as a kid because they weren't all there was. They were special. They were a treat. But everyone has their own favorite franchise, their own treat they'd like from LEGO, and those add up, potentially overshadowing anything LEGO could create themselves. In fact, Harry Potter's 2018 revival may have hastened the demise of Nexo Knights and Elves since those were both castle themes and this has elements of each. I usually keep away from lines like this because I don't want to celebrate corporate consumerism too much. But I figured I could make an exception this one time for a couple of lines I do really like in spite of it all. And that's it for today. I hope fans of both these franchises enjoyed my look at them. If you want to support my work, please consider my graphic novel series, Planet Ripple. You can buy the books on Amazon or read an early draft of the first book for free. Links to everything in the description. We're in the endgame now, people. Less than 10 episodes remaining. Stick around for the home stretch. See you next time with Explorians. There's never been a mixture as magical as Harry Potter and Lego. Welcome to a wondrous world where you can feel the magic building. The new Lego Harry Potter collection. I too. The Rebels need your help. Build us more ships. Lego and Star Wars join forces for the first time. So you can build authentic Lego X-Wings and Y-Wings. Only you can help Luke and the Rebels defeat Darth Vader and his TIE Fighter and save the galaxy. You did it. You saved us. Lego made.